second episode of Not The Project. I'm Monica Smith. I'm Matt Wong. And to this week we uh, have uh, embellished our studio a little bit. We uh, had quite a few views and we wanted to make it better, right? And you did a lot of that work, so thank you for that. Well, it's in my house. Yeah, I... <laughs> don't tell them that. Matt, you've made a lot of videos this week. Yes, Actually, your good content fun. on Discernible yep. is very consistent. And you, you made a, a video that really like um, stood out to me was the police brutality one. And I've... On how amazing that Vic Paul have been. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, it, yep. was, it was great satire kind, there. And... Yeah, yeah it's pretty rough. Anyway. Um, anyway, moving on. Um, by the way, I respect police and what they've done, and if I'm in trouble, I'll still call them. Anyway, that's on a side note. But I want to talk about Parliament for a second. I was glued to the TV. You were. Yeah, I don't know if I'm still tired from that or not. But, um, look, we did, I guess you could say, lose the um, back-to-school campaign. Which is ridiculous. All we're asking for is to allow children to go back to school. I know, but I'll, I'll explain the rationale between for the people voting no to that. The rationale was, we do want kids to go back to school, but just not yet, when we're ready, when we're blah, blah, blah. And from a rational, from um, someone who's been watching the mainstream media this whole time, that actually makes sense, I think. But the problem is, is there's no scientific or health medical advice to back up that they can't go back to school now. And that's the problem, isn't it? Well, one of our, it's so cool. We have one of the doctors, you know, the original 13 doctors. Yes, and I We'll do. talk about our guests in a minute. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, so my, I, I just want to talk, we did have a win in parliament as well. And the win was the the motion to end the curfew was passed. Yes. Now, yes. to be clear, that doesn't mean the curfew's over. Although for many it is. I mean, if you look at, if you look at traffic data, it's yeah. up. Both anecdotally and data wise, you know, you've got Facebook and Google saying, look, people are going out. Yeah. Whether you like it or not. Yeah. But it would be great if it was legal because the, the, the idea that you can't, that you can't is, is not a nice thing. But the curfew was passed, uh, which, is, which is a win, and I think we should take that as a win. And I just want to quickly touch on what's coming up in Parliament, mm. if I can. Mm. So um, the coalition, so the Liberal Party and the Nationals, uh, are now doing a vote for no confidence. Um, so that's going to be a mm. big campaign that I will do on RDA and we'll talk about on our show um, as well. And yep. that's going through great. Parliament right now. And then... Um, so that, yeah, that, uh, sorry, just quickly, it might not go through, like the, we might not get the vote for mm. no confidence in Daniel Andrews and his government, but what it will do is it's going to create pressure. And, and Which I, is everything. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. Everything. And I think everything we've done is creating pressure. And also what it does is um, it makes the conversation about the mistrust for the government right now a mainstream conversation. Yes. And I think it can, make, it can make it easier for all of us to bring it up with our friends. Yeah, I think that okay. are on the fence. Or, Great. Yeah, Great. Um, and look, the omnibus bill. We're, we're, do you want to just quickly say a little bit about the omnibus bill? So, so there's a bill right now. Uh, we've been railing against the state of emergency expansion, which was a few weeks ago now, which passed. The omnibus bill is, you know, they always do omnibus bills, and I'll do a better breakdown of it on the weekend. But I got an email from an MP. I don't know if you can see this. These are all the acts I've got to go through, like 300 pages each. Like but you're a speed reader. So, look, this omnibus bill is potentially terrible and we won't go into a lot now. We've got stuff to talk about, but we're basically talking about, it, again, expanding the powers of the, not just the chief health officer, but the whole, the whole regime, the ability to remove and detain people by force who pose a serious risk to the community and the definition of what is that risk. So, look, that's potentially bad. But the good news is they're debated in the lower house today or tomorrow, and it's not going to get to the upper house until October. So we've got a couple of weeks yes. to get our heads around it and figure out what's going on. And in that time, I'm trying to get a Labor MP on this show because I want to talk to them. Yeah. And, look, I know everyone's angry at them, but I want to I want to humanise them a bit and, and see if they can explain exactly yeah. what their side of the, the deal is. I'd love to hear their side. Mm. Not in Parliament, but with people. With yeah. an audience, you know what I mean? Yeah, not these sound bites. Like no. proper anyway. Okay, so that's yeah. the omnibus bill. Yep. But just quickly, um yeah. like let's just say for example, can, can I get arrested under that omnibus bill, do you think? Look, technically we can all get arrested. Basically they're making it so that anyone can be appointed a, a health uh, authorized officer who can exercise the emergency powers and they're also making they're making you be defined as a serious risk to public health if you disobey any of these orders Directives, yeah. rather than before it was your health health risk if you know put in some doctor stats but now it'll be if you disobey any health order you are classified as a serious risk and then based on that then they can do all the powers yeah. they can detain you in a hotel and yeah and we will get more into that but yeah. look matt if you go to jail i'll i'll wait for you 
You're supposed to Somebody say. Somebody will look after you. You're supposed to say, I'll do the same thing for you. I'm not that brave. Oh, gosh. I'm really not. RDA members, save me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you, you should introduce the... Um... So today's guest, today's show, we have Dr. Eamon Matheson up first. So do you remember there was a letter that came out from all yeah. the doc 13 original doctors, and mm -hmm. this has been signed by... Anyway, one of those original doctors is coming in and will speak to us. Second guest is a legend of a man, Jim Penman. So, so much more of a legend in person than like, so even good. more of a legend in person, I feel. Well, he started what? Jim's mowing, Jim's gardens, Jim's fridges, Jim's tool shop, Jim's <laughs> bunnings, Jim's carpets, Jim's cameras. Okay, we get it. What? Yeah, just lots, lots of Jim lots stuff. Of Jim. So he's, he's been, you know, he'll be in. Uh, and then the third and fourth guest is all about council. So, you know, there are council elections coming up. And I, uh, I interviewed a couple of councillors. Yeah. yeah, and counts, I don't think council elections have ever gotten this much attention from the people. Mm. I have people messaging me all the time asking, who should I vote for in my area? I don't know how to use it. Am I supposed to use pencil? Am I supposed to use pen? You know, and we are jumping on this right now. We have, you know, a couple of weeks. It's a month, you I know, think. It's I think we've month. got six weeks. Yeah. So we are going to be giving um, information um, throughout this show yes. uh, up until then and on RDA, obviously, yep. so that we can... People... I don't think Victorians have ever been so informed about the council elections. Like, I know. You guys are going to know, like, really yeah. what's going on and the impact of your vote. Yeah. Any, anyway. Anyway, shall we go to our first guest? I assume yeah, they, they don't want to hear us talk it. anyway. Oh, so yeah. They don't want to... Yeah, maybe not. Who's our first guest? Lead no. us in. What are we doing? Um, it's... I say Eamon. You said Eamon. I okay. don't know if that's... I don't know. All right. Oh, we'll just say Dr. Matheson. Yep. Dr. Matheson, here we go. We're very lucky today to have Dr. Eamon Matheson here with us, Matt, aren't we? Yes. Yes. Thank you, Doctor, so much for coming. Thank you. Now, Dr. Matheson is one of the co-writers of the letter that went ballistic about two weeks ago. I had it sent to me by about 40 or 50 different people. And, you know, it's created a lot of momentum in, in, in our communities. And we're just so thankful to have doctors speak out because, you know, I can say all these different things, but it doesn't mean anything. I don't, I'm not a doctor, you know. So thank you so much, firstly, I'd thank like you. to say. Thank you. Um, and secondly, it's had over you know, 500 signatures now from doctors. And so it's it's gone a lot faster than I expect you would have imagined. Um, and Dr. Matheson, Matheson has told me that their, their website uh, came down because it just had such an overwhelming result. And they've got a new website coming up, which is going to be um, COVID Medical Network. And it's going to be open to nurses and, and other people in the medical field. So just keep an eye on that. It did not get taken down. They chose to take it down, which is a good thing. Um, and yeah, you know, how, how, how do you feel about the doctor's letter, Matt? Well, I, is, it, the reaction's been interesting, isn't it? But in the other countries, I mean, just earlier you were saying to me that in US and other areas, the response wasn't quite so warm. But here it feels like we were waiting for you guys to come out with this. Yeah, it's a good point because I think uh, it seemed to be the time was right. I think that the issue of extending the, the state of emergency mm -hmm. powers mm -hmm. brought that to the fore. I think Australians are really quite you know tough people, mm -hmm. and they'll put up a lot with a lot, uh, particularly when they're doing it for uh, for others. Um, and it got to that point where they, I don't think they really trusted that this was you know the harm that was being caused. They couldn't see that this was worth the effort of the what was being achieved from it mm. um, and so yeah overseas uh, the media really it was extraordinary censorship that came down on the guys in the US and also mm. uh, you know across the world uh, so we were partly expecting the same sort of thing to happen and we were very surprised over you know astonished really that it didn't and it was actually an overwhelming positive I think it was just about the timing people were ready to hear it well I think they, they wanted to hear it because we've been told over and over from our premier we must follow the data we must follow the experts and, okay that to me sounds like a good thing that sounds rational but then as soon as we start to hear some other experts come out many of you now over 500, 500 people saying yes, there are some issues here. Yeah. Dan is now not, uh, I, I don't understand what's going on here. Well, yeah, I think there was a, the illusion of uh, a unanimous, um, you know, uh, position by all doctors. I think that was, you know, in a sense, an illusion. And that was the shield behind which they uh, made many of the decisions uh, to in the lockdown measures. Um, to do that. And so you, you do mention the experts. It's interesting. Um, we don't really know who they are. And the part of the problem mm. of this process is that it, it, it isn't 
really very open. Mm. Um, uh, there are concerns about n not having a broad multidisciplinary approach and not having an open disclosure mm. approach um, so that everyone can trust the decisions and trust who um, who is making them and why mm. they're making them. So uh, there are many people behind the scenes that disagree with the narrative and the approach and the and the measures taken and um, and many many have doctors have uh, uh, contacted me directly to say to congratulate us for standing up for this that they totally agreed but many of them express the fear and concern that there that there could be some repercussions for them professionally and that they are reluctant to some are reluctant to put their names to things which says something also about the culture uh, both in healthcare uh, and perhaps politically yeah. that there is a fear of standing up about this and we we we, we were told you know gee you've been so courageous and I'm thinking well, not really. We just said something that's really quite obvious and yeah. really straightforward and, and what we know to be true and, and what we are really concerned about. It's not really courageous, but um, there hasn't been any negative uh, consequences yet. Yeah. Um, but yet there hasn't even been a response so far from oh. the uh, from the Premier, which is kind of amusing. It's um, interesting uh, talking about the truth. I mean, I, have you seen that saying it's... Um w when truth becomes a revolutionary act or something. Have you seen that no, quote somewhere? No. Um, it, times are dangerous when telling the truth becomes oh, right. a revolutionary act. Or so, a dangerous or courageous you know, thing to do. Um, yeah, it's very because, strange. But, you know, in, in America, um, I know that the doctors were censored a lot, but the a lot of the government were behind them as well, actually. Um, mm. You know, but Daniel Andrews hasn't even, you know, acknowledged this letter, has he? Well, I Not as far as we know. It would have, I imagine it would have really <laughs> perturbed him ago. because he's really set up this thing where we have to only trust his health experts. Yeah. From what I hear, it's very difficult to get a conference with Brett Sutton from yeah. the medical community. Well, yeah, this is, uh, it appears to be somewhat dysfunctional. Um, we, I, I don't really know, but from what people are saying, I mean, it's a very difficult situation that they're in. Um, people are acting in very strange ways. Uh, people tell me every day about their interactions with people in the that they pass in the street and, oh and things that uh, are odd. So in this culture of fear and, you know, coercion and things um, and uncertainty uh, where emotion seems to sort of override reason, it, as I said, I think on one of the TV programs, it's probably a similar phenomenon or a similar culture is caught on in the highest levels of decision making. So I don't know, usually in medicine when um, uh, there is a challenge to um, the data or the what the decision making. Most um, most doctors would be open to listening to that um, uh, pers other perspectives and other criticisms, um, and would take that on board because we all know we, we don't know everything, um, sure. and we take uh, we take the opinions or the the expertise of others on board, mm -hmm. um, and we think that broadening that out. Um, perhaps to involve people who have more of a clinical exposure to the realities of what's happening and, and who are familiar with all of the other medical conditions yeah. that still exist, that still continue in our community, uh, that need to be addressed and, and are falling further and further behind with each yeah. day and each week. And, and this is the alarming thing that we're concerned about is creating probably Victoria's worst ever public health crisis. Right. Well, we would definitely like um, to know what expert, who, which experts are, you know, um, giving Dan advice. And I, I know for a fact I'd want you on that panel, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll I, try. We'll try and make. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm I'm just an anaesthetist who well, uh, is aware of the the information and and but you're liaises with. You know, but I liaise with care. others, and um, yeah, I am very concerned about the. Um, you know what's happening out there in the community and no one seems to be listening to it we we just our little website um we seem to be an avenue for people to voice their uh concerns we've had so many um uh stories yeah. uh that have poured through the website telling their uh um uh, their circumstances and they're really quite harrowing to read and, and we would like we can't wait to see what you do with that because i know you're going to do something with it um now i have i have one more question about Sorry. no i have one more question um if you did i asked you about what it would be like to you know be be daniel andrew's advisor on this but i i like asking this question um if you had 30 seconds or 45 seconds of daniel andrew's undivided attention what would you say to him hmm. I'd say he needs to listen to uh, the doctors who are actually out there at the coalface on the ground, seeing what's actually happening, seeing the actual implications of these um, lockdown measures. Yeah. I would also ask him to broaden his um, uh, um, exposure to experts. We we have um, we we have access now to some of the leading um, 
analysts in the world who can tell you that what a picture and can present it to you. Um, all of the information is coming out to give you a give people a more reassuring understanding of what's going on and not operate out of fear. Um, th this is not how medicine's done. I, I think I explained that it, everything that seems to be done out of the decision-making offices is contrary to the basic principles of good medicine. So we don't terrify, oh. terrorize our patients. Uh, we give them the real mm -hmm. information and, and in perspective and, and are always reassuring. That doesn't seem to be occurring. And we listen to our colleagues and, we, and we're humble and we should be humble um, but in, in terms of uh, facing particularly difficult conditions and things that no one person or one little group can sort of fathom because this is a massive, massive problem, um, mostly due to the measures taken yes. to, uh, to manage uh, a situation which all of the evidence is pointing towards is um, far less significant than was initially yeah. um, uh, thought to be. Well, Dr. Dr. Kendrick from last week said, you know, uh, half of the coronavirus deaths in England were actually caused from the reaction to coronavirus, not the coronavirus itself, or that you're more likely to die in a car accident if you're under 25 than you are to die from coronavirus. So these these facts are coming out. Yes. So, um, and um, look, I just wanted to say as well to you guys that next week, uh, we're actually going to do a special on, you know, the child psychology behind it, uh, which I think is really important because there's so many parents out there homeschooling and they don't really know what the effects are going to be. So uh, we're going to talk about that next Absolutely. week. But um, uh, Doctor or Matt, do you have anything more you'd like to add to, to this Well, look, what can, what can the public do to help? Or do we need to just sit back and watch what you guys are about to come out with? Look, I think what, we're, what we would like to do um, is provide an alternate source of information um, Great. That is that is open. Mm -hmm. That is that explains where this comes from. A place where people can go in their own time to have a look at yeah. the issues. There's probably six to eight issues that are sort of supporting the narrative mm -hmm. of uh, these severe lockdowns, and each of them uh, can be challenged yeah. um, and looked at with with uh, with reason and with in calmness mm -hmm. at people's own time. Great. So we will make that available. The other thing is that people can show their support. So we will have a, a sign up thing for both medical people, doctors, um, and as well as nurses and, and others who are all coming and t telling us their stories and they want people to know what they're seeing. Um, yeah. You know, maternal and child health care nurses that are telling us that it's just horrific what they are seeing as a consequence of young mums going home and having no supports and the impacts that that's going to have on the, even the youngest children for, yeah. and, and the impacts that we can't even imagine at this point. But this is a very, very unusual circumstance. Yeah. We've flipped our entire society and what we even consider to be good health care and what is good for our community um, for the, for something that we uh, have the evidence that we will present is far less significant than was portrayed yeah. in the hysteria which began 2020 so and that's um, good news that is that, great that's news, good news we, have, we should be celebrating that this, hey guys, know, it's exactly. not as bad as we thought why is everyone protecting the uh the, the narrative that it's like going to just break the world yeah. apart and like, so the evidence let's just accept that yeah but, the um, evidence is overwhelming and the other yeah. thing that people can do because i know i've read all of the I've read most of the stories. It's really quite harrowing what people are going through. And they found that it's an avenue that they can tell the stories sure. through the website. That will be available. And they right. can then also say whether they're happy for their stories mm -hmm. to be told further so that others know that, A, that there are a lot of people suffering out there and that they're not alone, and maybe that their stories can actually help make a difference Definitely. so people can listen. Yes, and I think, you know, a saying that I always say is a problem shared is a problem halved, so even if no one reads them ever, it still can be nice. No, so they're being read and we, they're being responded uh, to, I can tell that's, you. That's good to know, they're, they're being read by doctors and their helpers. So, um, you know, this show and my Reignite Democracy Australia will support everything that you're doing. And so everyone's going to get updates on the website when it's up. So don't freak out. It's coming back, I promise. And thank you so much for coming yeah. and right. speaking to us, Doctor. I really, really appreciate no, it, Doctor Thanks, Amen. And Thanks we'll for see having you me again, on. I'm sure. Yeah, okay. <laughs> thank you. Cheers. Thank you. So, good news from Matheson, Dr. Matheson. Yeah. It's all good news. It's, it's happening. It's happening. It's coming out. The, the site wasn't hacked. They took it down themselves. Anyway, we'll see what happens there in the coming days. We'll keep you updated. Yep. Yep. Uh, so next we have Jim Penman. You all know him. He's been one of the biggest spokespeople for the business. Mm. Um, I don't really need to introduce him much more than that because we, we do it all in the interview. So here's Jim Penman. So we're here with Jim's from Jim's Mowing. Now, Jim actually did a segment on the RDA show, yeah. I think the second week, because you were one of the only 
really well-known businessmen mm. that were standing up for the inconsistencies in the rules and the regulations. And you also have just under 4,000 franchisees Australia-wide, um, most of them in, in, uh, in, sorry, worldwide and most of them in Australia. So you've obviously been a huge voice for small businesses and I think it's given um, small businesses, uh, yeah, some feeling of comfort that you're standing up for them. Um, you know, I, 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 there's a letter that you've done recently and I just want to pick apart a few points of it and just mm. have you comment on it. Um, so the first sentence is, uh, the only solution to the crisis facing Victoria is that you remove Daniel Andrews as Premier and that you do it now. That's a very, very strong way to start the letter. Can you elaborate on why you think that's so important? Because the, the Premier, is basically, he basically he's stuck. He's taken a certain kind of a line and he's staying to it and he won't shift because I think he sees it as political weakness. Look, the typical example of this is when he originally came out with the stage four regulations. It specifically allowed sole operators to work alone. Mm. There was no question. That was right yes. at the heading. It was a very detailed, obviously done with expert health advice, about six pages, sole operators working alone, clearly okay. A week later, the Premier goes on a news conference and says, oh, you can't get your mode, lawns mowed or your house clean. Now, why did he say that when his own regulations said the opposite? Because he didn't know his own regulations, mm -hmm. clearly. Mm -hmm. So he's now got a situation, he's got expert medical health advice to say it's safe to operate, but he himself has made a statement opposite at a press conference. Now, a man of integrity, and compassion and decency would clearly say, look, sorry, I made a mistake. Mm. But no, I can't be seen as weak. I can't be seen as backing yeah. down. I'd rather throw tens of thousands of the most vulnerable Australians out of work. And, and your, your, your franchisee, do they get funding or, or help from the government at well, all? No, there's no help. Because no job keeper? No job seeker? Well, they get, um, they get the doll, whatever that is. Oh. They get a fraction. But that's not enough to support a family. No, of course not. And actually, what makes it worse, we've got some franchisees who are actually on like um, bridging visas, like student visas oh, and so forth. They've got nothing. nothing. We've got some, one poor girl in dog wash who's actually been cadging, asking her neighbours for you know, handouts, for, for leftover food, for example. Wow. We've got to go fund me within gyms where we're supporting her. Some wow. of us are lending her money and stuff. And I said to her, if she gets evicted, which is, a, which is quite a possibility, she can come and stay at our conference centre and we'll work out some way to feed her. I mean, it's, it's, at that level, it's, it's appalling, the suffering that's going on. Jim, you raise an interesting point. We, we have an unfolding humanitarian disaster is what I'm starting to see. Mm. That's the real problem here. Things like you mentioned dog washing, you have a dog washing service, right? Yes. So we've just seen recently that you're allowed to now have dog washing if you have a building, mm. but not if you're mobile. Most of your operators would be mobile. Yes, they're all mobile. What is the logic besides getting Andy Medic's vote for the state of emergency? What's the logic behind allowing one and not the other? Well, it, 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 there's no logic to it at all. I mean, if you try and understand health, what they're actually saying is, okay, if you've got a service where you've got five or six people working together in the same building, that's, that's fine. That's okay. There's no danger to health. Do the exact same thing one person by themselves. That's, that's an extreme. The health experts, he actually said, the health experts have said this is not safe. I mean, who on earth would believe that sort of crappy lie? Everybody knows it's a bribe to Andy Medic. And all I can say is that I don't blame Andy for looking after his people, but it's a pathetic offer, little dribble of a bribe to give this man dictatorial powers over the Victorian economy for the next six months. This is what I don't understand. <clears throat> we are having absurdities like the dog washing situation. Mm. Whilst causing through it a humanitarian disaster, as I said, you have, what, how, a few thousand franchisees here in Australia. Yes. Most of them are not available to get, you know, the job keeper or, or some kind of support. I imagine that you've told us one story. I imagine there's many, many stories of these people going to the wall. What are we going to do? Well, it's, it's terrible. I personally know of two franchisees who've actually got family members attempted suicide. One of them's been, been you know, it's just... The suffering, the, the grief, the frustration, I get it every day, all the time. The Premier doesn't see any of this. The Premier is so locked away behind his walls. He has no idea. I don't know if he'd care if he did, but the suffering is absolutely appalling. The, the madness, I mean, everybody knows suicide attempts are up 30%. Alcohol consumption, you, you get this domestic violence. I, I see it, I hear these things. 
it's 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 grim. It's really awful. It's very hard to take. How are you holding so much on your shoulders? You're all these franchises, cheeses going through this. Are, are you okay? Look, personally, I'm I'm fine. I, I've got a look. I've got a my my income is a little bit down, but mm. still we're still profitable because I've got so much interstate income. My family's got a nice big house with a big garden. Um, I've got plenty to do. I'm running a business. I'm I'm very fully occupied. Personally, I'm fine. It's it's the weight of my people that really is hard to take. It's like it's like carrying a giant load on me, and you can never even for one minute forget about that. Mm. I, it, it's awful. Um, so you know, you have been a savior for a savior in some ways to so many of your franchisees because you've given them an income, you've given them a lifestyle, and most of the time you're like, you know, you're you're being able to support them, and now you're having to carry the weight of their emotions and their lifestyles falling apart. It must be quite a contradiction to. What you're used to. I, I must say, my franchisors, we have a system of franchisors who look after franchisees have been fantastic. Mm. Their income is completely stopped. They're, they're no fees at all, but they're still ringing franchisees regularly and saying, how are you going? Mm. Because they're unaware of the, of the mental health issues. We're very concerned about mental health in gyms, even before this crisis. Yeah. Mm. We had a terrible situation a couple of years back where one of our people went crazy, killed their three little girls and their wife, and it was very, very upsetting. We've set up this system of, of mentors so that franchisees can volunteer to look after other. They're not paid, they just help others. It's People, great you had that in place before this. Yes, anyway. we have all kinds of things. We send them stickers, fridge magnets with, the, the, um, with all the, the emergency numbers. We have, um, we have all kinds of, we have franchisee, fran all franchisors get mental health training these days yeah. to help franchisees with problems. So it's been an issue in the past and now with this it's just gone through the roof. I don't think they have any idea of the mental health issues that have come out of this, and it won't be short term. Mm, this will be true. long, long term. It's not just the financial problems, it's the health problems. And other kinds of health problems. I know I got an email yesterday from somebody, basically their, um, the, the woman's um, had a terminal cancer. Now she's been battling and fighting it out, but just the kind of struggles to try and cope with what's going on at home, with her husband out of work, with, with having to have homeschooling of children, and she's got these cancer issues and stuff. I mean, none of this stuff gets into the media, but the, the suffering is, is appalling. Jim, I have to thank you for coming on here, but not just being on here, but for being one of the only business leaders who are speaking out, because I know you copped flack for coming out for this, and I know you've been misrepresented in some ways, but the fact that you're willing to stand up for what what your people and for the rest of us is, is incredible. Is there anything that you want to say to the people out there? We've got a lot of people watching. What's your message? That, I know you're telling Dan needs to resign, but watch the people hear from you right now. The, the best thing anybody can do, the only people who can solve this, this crisis, this problem, is the Labor members of Parliament. Mm. And I say anybody who has especially if they've got a Labour lecture. I'm in a Labour lecture. I've got the Deputy Premier wow. um, as my, supposedly, my MP. <laughs> he doesn't represent me in any case, I can, I can tell you that. And I've written to him, everybody should write to their MP and say, and especially yeah. people who, whose minds have been changed, to say something like, look, I've been a Labour voter all my life, but if you don't, if you don't do something yeah. to listen to yeah. it and help people, then I'm not going to vote for you again. If people can say... I was thinking I'm a swing voter, but if this goes on, I'll be liberal next time. I mean, if people can pressure their MPs, they're the only people that can solve this crisis. Yeah. I, my latest letter is written to them personally, directly. And I know there is a movement because they're running scared because the opinion polls are running against them. Yes. And the Premier cannot change his mind. He is, he is stuck. He's a man. He's a he-man. I'm not going to change. I'm not going to listen to all these, you know, whinging sods. You know, I'm going to take the hard line. And he'll destroy the state if he goes on like this. So it, only, the, only the MPs can control him. And listen, they've been cowed for years. Mm -hmm. he, he, he controls that party. He's crushed them totally. There's not yeah. one voice can stand up to him. But I hope these people, and I know many of them are decent people. I know they went into politics. We were talking about, yeah. They've yeah. got to be human beings too. In, yeah. you know, so how are, they, how are they crushed under this weight of Daniel Andrews? And I'm sure they listen to their constituents to a certain extent. I know there is a movement out there, and I'm just hoping these people can be made to listen because there's council elections coming up too. And at the way things are going, I believe the Labour Party is going to be crushed in that because people are Ooh. so fed up, they're so angry. 
and they're aware of this kind of issue. And then you've got the yeah. federal election coming up. And then yeah. I know it's two years, but there's a state election coming up. They've got to be thinking about their own re-election prospects because the way things are going, Labor's going to be wiped out in this state. Yeah. They, they've controlled it for so long, mm -hmm. basically ever since Kennett, really. And, and people will not forgive and not forget. We won't let them. Sorry, I mean, Monica RDA, sure. RDA, Reignite Democracy Australia will be on this bandwagon the whole way along. Trust me, our members are, they're really active. So look, I can make tell you, sure. for myself, look, some years ago, the Liberal Party asked me to um, to run some fundraisers and so forth and give them some help. And I said, no, look, state election is not really important. State politics is not that important. <laughs> Let me tell you, in two years' time. Tim. <laughs> in two years, I had no idea. I had no comprehension. <laughs> of how damaging the, having the wrong government at the state yeah. level, how much power they mm -hmm. have. In two years' time, I'm going to be throwing everything I possibly yeah. can to make sure we've got a decent government in this state. Yeah. The question is whether there'll be much of Victoria left. Tell yes. you what, I would emigrate myself. I mean, honestly, I would leave to another state if I could. Mm -hmm. We're locked in, my staff, my family, everything else. But goodness, and I know people are saying this, they're mm -hmm. saying Victoria's not the place to be anymore. Oh. No. It used to well, be, the, it used to be, the, to be. The, the most livable city in the world. It's become mm. the least livable, well, not the least. That's an overstatement. But it's become not very fun. I wrote, I wrote a letter yesterday, actually, a pleading letter with the WA government because one of my friends says he wants to move across to Perth. Mm. I mean, this is so common. They can't work here. We don't know what the future is. Yeah. Let's go. There's plenty of work in Perth. So I wrote them a letter to, to the, the authorities saying, please, can you let this guy and his family in? He's a great franchisee. He's got a 4.9 star rating. You know, there's plenty of work for him. He's going to be looked after when he gets there. Please let him in. I mean, this is what this is going to happen. But people we don't want to lose people. We don't want to lose people. No, I think it's too late for many. But look, there you have it from Jim. That's what you need to do. If you are interested in pushing this through is to contact your Labour MP and say, look, I can't vote for you if you keep doing this. So this is a man with a lot on his shoulders and we appreciate having him here. Thank you, Jim, for coming in. Can I just say before, I, I know you just like finished him off and stuff, but I just want to ask one more question and then, you can, then we can stop. Is that okay? Sure. Okay. <laughs> if you had, let's say Daniel Andrews was sitting right there and you had 30 seconds of his undivided attention, what would you say to him? I would just try and impress on him the disaster that he's inflicting on the state. I would try and convey to him some of the pain that I hear every day, which he's insulated from, and just plead with him to please play sense, forget his pride, and have some sense of decency and integrity, and do something to stop this dreadful disaster taking place. Thank you, and I think we, we all agree with that sentiment. Okay. Do you want to finish it again? Or? No, I'll cut that bit at the end. <laughs> oh, it's only because of the time. We're at 15 minutes. Okay, Mon, council elections are coming up. Who yeah. cares? Right? Oh, I never did. No, I don't. But I, I do now. And here's why. Yeah. Council elections, I reached out to the current Deputy Lord Mayor of Melbourne. His name's Aaron Wood. Big Fish? Yes, and because he's trying to become the mayor. Yeah, that's, yeah. Right? Okay. So he's going to try and, and, and he's running to be mayor and I wanted to interview him. But I came up with an idea. I thought, I don't want to be bamboozled by politicians. So I rang my friend on the Sydney City Council. So there's a woman named Angela Vithoukas. Angela is very interesting. She, she's on Sydney Council okay. as a councillor and she's been there for years. But she's cool because she is also the leader of the Small Business Political Party. Oh, wow. Yeah, so she stands up for small businesses because she, she had a cafe mm. in Sydney. So Sydney had their version of a lockdown and she had a cafe on George Street, the main street, mm -hmm. back in 2015 or 14, they, okay. the, the light rail came through and they closed down all of George Street. So her, her business, gone. So they had their version of a lockdown. And since then, she's been standing up and championing small business and just, just the voices that don't get airtime. Yeah. Anyway, I think she'll be a friend of the show long term. So I called her first and said, hey, give me some advice on how to v interview this guy, Lord Aaron, this, yeah. this Deputy Lord Mayor. And this is what Angela had to say. Hi, Angela. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. It's lovely to be here. Uh, Angela, I need your help. So you are, you know, as I said, you're currently on the City of Sydney Council. I need help in interviewing our current Deputy Lord Mayor of Melbourne. His name is Aaron Wood, and he's running to be the Mayor of Melbourne. I know nothing about him or how council elections work, so that's what I'm going to be asking him. But because you're on the inside, what should I be looking for in this interview in a couple of hours' time? So I would really be interested to know where his political affiliations sit. Mm. I, in, in, I haven't seen anything in his material that says I'm a Liberal candidate or a Labor candidate or a Greens candidate. 
it may not be obvious um, which party he has an alliance or an allegiance to, but it should matter to the people that may vote for him. So that does have an effect, just as it does at state and federal. You know, if, if I find out he's a Greens poly or a Labor poly or whatever, would that influence the way he, he runs things? Absolutely. And it will influence who he listens to and oh, who he right. takes advice from right. and what his agenda is. So he would want to align the City of Melbourne's agenda to make sure that it reflects the, the state and federal agendas as well. And, and it also would would sort of stop him from making comments on whether on when those parties bring down policy or legislation. So who, right. who does he owe his loyalty to? Okay. And of course, you know, we're talking about Aaron Wood, but I have no particular attachment to any candidate for the, for the council election. So that would be the same for all of them. We need to be seeing who their loyalties are to. Absolutely. You've got to peel back the layers. There's no point them saying, I'm running for the city of Melbourne, when yes. we know that every major city in Australia is significant mm. and politically they play a huge role. Look how the city of Melbourne is affected more than any other capital city by the lockdowns mm. right now. So you would want to know, is he for federal government, the sitting federal government or against? Okay. All right. So I'll ask him that. Is there anything else I should be on the lookout for in general when I interview <clears throat> this guy or any other uh, front runners for mayor? So it's interesting to ask them when election time comes up with all politicians, and this is the same impact that that happens to me, and it's everywhere in Australia, whether it's local, state or federal government. Uh, in particular, local government affects people on the ground immediately. So often yeah. all the policies that local government has can change a person's life very quickly, whether it's business policies, residential policies. Gone are the days and it was just roads, rates and rubbish for any council. Right. It's always a lot more than that. However, the difference is who will they stand up for? And pre-election, they'll come out with great policies and promise to fund a hundred different things and vote for me and you'll get all these things. I want to know, do they care about the little guy and the individual or only the squeaky wheel? Mm, okay, okay. Well, Angela, listen, thank you for coming on and giving me some ideas on how to interview this guy. I'm a little bit nervous about it. Uh, and no, don't being... be. Don't be. He should be nervous. Oh, really? I guess we're putting him in front of tens of thousands of people. So, uh, no, look, thank you for being a friend of the show. I have a feeling we're going to see a lot more of you. I look forward to it. And to all the um, small businesses in Melbourne and in Victoria, on behalf of New South Wales, we, we feel for you. But hang in there because things will get better. Amazing. Thank you, Angela. Isn't it nice to see that other states understand what we're going through? Mm. I mean, it's hard to understand because they're not here, but... Mm. There are people interstate messaging me from Queensland and New South Wales. Mm. So thank you, Angela, for taking the time to talk to us. And I think she's got a really good point, and I'm feeling this at the moment with my members on RDA, is that no one has ever really cared about council elections before. Mm. Mm. But now that everything is seems to be crashing down around us, we're starting to look at anything that we can do to make a difference. Yes. And what I've understood from the council members that I've spoken to is, look, council itself is not meant to be political, okay? It's not meant yep. to be Labor or Liberal or Independent, really. Yes. But the fact is, is they are all affiliated with someone. Yeah. That's, yeah. And that's the fact. Yeah. And I don't think we've ever cared before who they're affiliated with mm. until now. Mm. And their positions are actually somewhat of a stepping stone to getting into a decision-making situation yeah. in Parliament. So... It is important who we vote for. It is. Yes, and that's why we have to work really hard over the next three weeks, okay? Yeah, yeah. You, you too. Me? We all okay. have to. All right, I'll try. Or we're doing letterbox so, drops, you okay. know? So can I just... Can I just keep making videos? That's what I'm good at. Yeah, okay, well, you do that. But right. on my website, if you go there, there's a place where you can sign up uh, to be a foot soldier. I'm calling you foot soldiers. Anyway. Join the clan. Yeah, I have over 550 people, Victoria-wide, already committed to doing letterbox drops. Let's be honest, maybe only half of them will actually do it because that's just how it works with volunteers. So. Are you seeing how this works, people? You know, I, I want to hide away in, in, in the edit suite and do stuff, and in she's your, out in there. In your tracksuit pants. Yes, in track. Well, when no one's here, there are no pants. And then when you're... Uh, anyway, uh, oh, Monica really gets onto it and pushes these campaigns. So look, now we are going to actually talk to Aaron Wood. So Aaron Wood is, is the deputy mayor, as I said, and I tried to use Angela's advice and uh, it turns out he's not really affiliated to a political party. Yeah. I don't know. Should we believe? Anyway, here's what Aaron Wood had to say. <laughs> Hi, Aaron. Thanks for your time today. Thanks for having me, Matt. Looking forward to the chat. Hey, it's, it's really cool that you came on because I think council elections are something that we really don't understand because... If you think about, we think about state and federal and we get all of that, but you guys get almost no airtime. And so what we wanted to do on today's show is to really educate everyone on what 
the importance of councils are. And I think people are interested. If you look at Queensland and Victoria right now, we're all suddenly taking an interest into politics. Even, even my wife, who hates it, she sits there riveted now listening to political stuff. So, I think it, it's an interesting one, isn't it? But um, I think in times of crisis, people really start to take an interest in politics because you know, so many of those decisions can impact our lives. They can impact our small businesses. Um, mm. I'm a small business owner myself. And uh, you, you kind of, you look to those leaders to know, you know, what sort of support are we going to get? How do we get the economy going, um, you know, after restrictions ease? You know, what, what does my future hold? Um, mm. You know, can my kids go back to school? All of these um, questions suddenly become really important to our daily lives. So I, I think that's exactly the same with the, the City of Melbourne elections, which um, uh, happened on October 24 is that I think this is the most important election in the history of council because of the economic challenge that COVID presents. You know, people's livelihoods are, are literally on the line. So I think there has to be a really strong interest in politics at times of crisis. Yes, well, okay, well, what can they do though? I mean, councils, okay, I, I spoke to Angela Vithorkas before you. Do you know who that is? No, I don't actually. Uh, she's an uh, independent councillor on Sydney City Council. And she said, "It's councils are no longer about what you call it rates, rubbish, and there's another R, roads, so, and sorry, roads, rate, rates, yep. rubbish, roads. So, what do you guys do besides fix the potholes and charge me rates? Thank you, and uh, collect my rubbish." Well, look, I must firstly say I'm I'm not here to kind of sprinkle my track record, but I was the one who froze rates for for City of Melbourne because of all the cost of living pressures. But roads, rates and rubbish are a really important part of what we do. And we should never forget the basics, you know, rubbish collection, making sure footpaths are, you know, kept the way they should be and fixing potholes in roads is actually really important. So we've got to get the basics right. But if you think about just about any service, um, whether it's childcare, whether it's family services, whether it's maternal and child health, um, whether it's libraries, uh, events, you know, economic activation, small business grants, there is so many um, services and major projects that uh, a city like City of Melbourne or Sydney uh, handles. We've got a budget of you know six hundred nineteen million dollars in our last wow. budget, so it's not wow. insignificant. And you know assets of about four and a half billion. So it's a big organisation with a, a really big remit. And just about anything once you leave your front door um, is is handled by by us. Bar you know major things like education, you know public transport, and those sort of things. Yeah. So okay, what was what does it mean specifically our vote this time? Well, first of all, who's voting? So you're, you are currently the deputy Lord Mayor of Melbourne and you're trying to get an upgrade, right? To be the mayor of Melbourne. That's exactly right. <laughs> you, you cover around the Melbourne CBD. What, like what, how big is that? Yeah. So it's, it's the 38 square kilometers, which is what you wouldn't know as the central city, the CBD, but we've yeah. also got where I live in Kensington, you know, we've got places like North Melbourne and West Melbourne and Parkville and, you know, East Melbourne and South Bank and Dockland. So it's, it's really that kind of uh, very inner city. The, mm -hmm. the central business district is the, obviously the engine room of Victoria's economy. But the reason it's so important is that city of Melbourne, just our local government area contributed just a, 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 few, a few years ago before the pandemic, 40% of Australia's GDP. Wow. So between Sydney and Melbourne, Mel, uh, Sydney had 33% of Australia's GDP. So between just those two central city municipal governments was over 70% of Australia's GDP. So if Melbourne suffers, Victoria suffers. If Melbourne suffers, Australia suffers. That's why a vote in a local government election is is even more important than just, you know, whether or not your rubbish is going to get collected or, or whether or not you've got childcare places. Okay. And what happens with my vote? If I vote you in over whoever the mayor is now or someone else, aren't you all basically this? Okay. I'm, I'm, I don't want to set you up to do a political speech. I feel like I am, but I, I want to know what, why should I vote? Whether it's in that LGA or I'm not in your LGA, I'm outside. What, what does it mean? Uh, look, I, it means a lot. I think, I don't think party politics is a good thing to have in local government. Uh, so I'm unaligned. Um, I'm not a member of a political party. Uh, I'm a resident and a small business owner. And, you know, I've got a track record of standing up for rate pays on all sorts of issues. I won't go into those, but sure. I, I think where your vote goes with me is it goes to me and my team who have all got a, a small business focus. So yeah. um, we don't sort of just focus on that at the detriment to all sorts of other livability issues, but when we set a challenge like the economic recovery um, from COVID, and what we've got to talk about here is the central city again of Melbourne has been the hardest hit local government in Australia. So mm. $22 billion already this year has been wiped off the gross local product um, just of, of city of Melbourne. So there's a huge recovery task ahead of us. And I think we need 
a team that actually understands what it's like to build a business, lose a business, you know, to really have some skin in the game uh, mm. instead of perhaps being someone who has been a, you know, a political student or operative, you know, and he's looking at this as a bit of a stepping stone or maybe, you know, you just, you're not a resident or you're not a small business. I think you need to, to have some skin in the game. Okay. So Aaron, I need to write, I, from the brief Googling I've done of you, I can see that you've been a big champion of environmental causes, which kind of makes sense, I guess, here in Melbourne. But one of the concerns for people with, with people who care about the environment or campaign for it, obviously is that you're going to put the environment ahead of humans, you know, our livelihoods and our businesses. And obviously now, you know, you're talking a lot about business, but everyone's, every politician is talking about business. How, how do we know that people, how do we know that it's not going to be change after an election? And I'm not just talking about you. I'm talking about every other LGA. All of you guys are now campaigning for our vote. How do we know who you will answer to afterwards, where your pressure will come from? Yeah, I think this is the, the difficult thing, isn't it? That the politicians make promises and then they don't necessarily deliver on them. So my track record, again, speaks for itself. Eight years um, in local government, but I didn't come from politics. I came from small business. Mm. And, you know, when I say I'm going to do something, I deliver it. And again, history speaks for itself there. I'm not over-promising here. I'm, you know, the, all the election platforms that I'm running on are very manageable. I'm the chair of finance and governance at the moment at the city. So I understand how the budgets work, for example. Mm. I understand what, you know, regulatory powers we have. And that's not a lot. Like the Lord Mayor's role in a big city government like Melbourne is really about bringing, you know, the best parts of the city together, whether it's industry or business or residents, and then helping them so that those ideas flourish. You don't have a lot of executive levers like, you know, a local government in America, for example, you're not the state oh. government, you're not the federal government. So okay. that's a really important thing I think is to be realistic about what you can achieve as Lord Mayor. You can achieve a lot, um, but you shouldn't over promise and under deliver. Okay. Okay. Look, I think people are, uh, ready for a change of some description so you might get a bit of a sympathy vote just people want that to happen so look be good luck with it uh i assume it's compulsory for all of us to vote it is it is matt unfortunately you know in this great democracy of australia you, you do get a fine if you don't vote and look again i just want to stress that this is i think the most important election we've ever faced you know it's great in our democracy that we have a vote make sure you vote you know the team that you want to, to lead us out of this um out of this economic challenge yeah, look, if everyone wants to get information on Aaron Wood, he's all over the place on social. He's got a whole team, LinkedIn. He's very active on LinkedIn. That's how I found him. He's very sympathetic, empathetic on LinkedIn. Really cool guy. But hey, I, I, I want to ask this, actually, I forgot. Why are you doing it? Because this is every, I'm playing devil's advocate here. Like, why do you, I'm trying to be suspicious of you, you know? Why, why are you doing this? What, because it's not, is it a full-time job or are you still running your own business right now? I'm still running my own business right now, but the Lord Mayor role is a full-time job. So, so you're about uh, to give up. What, you're, you're about to switch into that. Why? I just think for me, the biggest thing is I've got a business every hour that reaches out who's just going to the wall. They're on their knees. They're bleeding. They're not, that's not overstating what's going on. There's people no. in tears. Yeah. Their livelihoods are going up in smoke. Um, if I walk away from them and don't run in this election, then I just feel like I'm leaving in, them in the lurch. That's my, my single biggest reason for running. But I'm, I think the, big, the other big part of this is that I think if we can revive Melbourne, we, we revive Victoria, we revive Australia. So I think the challenge that, that is facing us is, is huge. But, you know, what, a, what an opportunity to play a role in Melbourne's recovery. That excites me. Okay. All right, everyone, get out there and vote because you have to. But find out information about your candidates in your LGA, in your local government area, and make an informed decision and have as many of these conversations as you can, if you can get a hold of their team. And Aaron Wood, thank you very much. I uh, hope it goes well for you. And I hope that you uh, stay true to what you're telling me and you become one of our, our champions and advocates if you get in. Thanks, Matt. Great to chat. Thanks, Aaron. Well, thank you for watching Not The Project. Although you keep telling me that the name has to change. Look, I've been getting conflicting ideas from uh, friends and family. They're saying that they, they don't think we should be associated even in a negative way, like, up to the project that we should come up with our own name. Maybe we, we should. Well, I'll, I'd like to hear from everyone in TV land what they think we should call it if we should change it all. But interesting ratings. Hey, thank you so much mm. everyone for watching it because we reached our goal is to match the uh, you know the well, more, network ten more, really more That'd right. Be awesome. We reached ten percent of their Friday night ratings in one show. So and that's because of you who want to see better conversations happening on the telly. And here we are. So thank you for your support. Speaking of which, we're currently reaching about 40,000 people, but we need to reach 400,000. 
It, yeah, I think it'd be good. Yeah, more than be good. I think that th this kind of a style of conversation needs to go out further. And the only way that's going to happen is if we let this thing stand on its own two feet. So what we're going to do yeah. is, we, well, the Facebook page already exists, not the project Facebook page. And depending on what you think we should name the show, we might change that name. But it, it's there. Go ahead and like it. Uh, I think there's a YouTube page as well. You think there's a YouTube page? I'm pretty sure you I made, made one. You made the YouTube page. <laughs> I made you an admin. Can you fix my errors, please? So, yeah, look, that's over there. Um, of course, RDA and, and Discernible. I, I'll speak for Discernible. I'm not going anywhere. I love doing my side interviews. RDA is not going anywhere. No. Um, I mean, look, RDA has... Uh, RDA, sorry, I mumbled my words, but RDA is really about petitioning to Parliament and doing campaigns and getting people active with Parliament and stuff like that. So this can stand on its own, but it will always have RDA in it because it's got me. In so, it, right. Yeah, so I'm always going to be... It's actually going to make RDA better. Hmm. So I'm excited about that. So everything's staying the same. We'll cross-post everything to pages. Mm -hmm. You know, you can still see the show everywhere. Yeah. Uh, but you'll just see the branding. It's just yeah. not the project everywhere. That's all. Yeah. What else I mean, is there? Yeah, back to the name. I mean, not the project. I think it's funny. I think it's funny. Yep. Everyone laughs. Yep. But we need it. Yeah. They're going to give us I advice. want to keep it. She wants to change it. So. Oh, I'm just, I just want to brainstorm it more. That's yeah, okay. all. Okay. I'm not sold on it. But anyway, we can do that. Mm. Are we... Are we um... Let's get our political on. The, oh, you got the call to actions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. call to actions. Yeah, so... I said before in the show, letterbox drops. It's going to be, sorry, but it is going to be the biggest letterbox letterbox campaign that council elections has ever seen. Hmm. It just is. So that's happening. It's going to be amazing, informative and educational and stuff like that. And then there will be campaigns about the omnibus bill because um, I don't want innocent people getting ar arrested and stuff. Sorry, that might be too harsh. I don't know. But the point is we're going to be campaigning to the upper house about the omnibus bill, which yep. is coming up in three weeks. Three weeks, That's yep. huge. We've got time. We're going to raise hell. Raise hell, yes. Like get really yeah. loud about Noise. it. You know, the thing is, um, I don't know if I already said this on the show or if I said this off camera, I don't know, but one of the members of parliament was telling me that even if a Labor seat, like they kind of have to vote with mm. Dan Andrews because, mm. but if they're in a marginal seat, which means they just kind of won yes. last time, if you, if we petitioned... That's what uh, Jim just said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Was, well, did he say it? In, just now? No, I don't think it was Jim. It was on the phone to someone else. Oh, anyway, Jim yeah. said we no. should pressure them. Well, no, he said we should pressure them, but he. But what this other guy said is that if they're in a marginal seat, they're going to want to listen to their constituents. Mm. So mm. if we make so much noise, they, they might vote um, against us, but they'll be shaking in their boots next time election comes. Yep. And we yep. will remind you. I will remind you. So mm. anyway, so, so yeah, we've got campaigns coming up is the point. That's it. Hope you like the new set. Hope you like the new name. Hope you like. Hope you like everything. The new name. Except, except we for don't my hair. Have a new name. We don't have a new name. Except anyway. my hair. Do you like the table? We like the table. We're trying to get a haircut. You just, <laughs> you, you've got to get a black market underground hairdresser. Don't right tell now anyone a... that you're getting a haircut. Oh, I'm not. It's illegal. But if you see my hair get shorter, it's because I did it. Because you myself. watch YouTube videos. Yeah. yeah. All right. Let's go. Bye. Bye.